minutes for this. And you're welcome to ask questions using the raise your hand function or write them in the chat. So without further ado, let me briefly introduce our wonderful speaker today, Arash Vazane. Arash is an avid reader, loves to watch movies and then talk about them, is fascinated by philosophy and psychology and enjoys the intricacies of life. He started his post-secondary journey at Kwantlen, obtained a master's degree in French literature from UBC and has worked in education for over two decades now. He's currently employed as a French instructor uh, at KPU and has been actively involved in the KPU community, serving on different committees and looking forward to various other projects and initiatives in the near future. So his presentation today, entitled Less Stress and Reduced Anxiety Levels to Enjoy More of Life, sounds like a great topic to me. Over to you, Arash. Thank you so much, Hammond. Thank you to everyone who's uh, who's here. I, it's, it's such a pleasure, honor to to be here and to be uh, presenting here the the as the last presenter. I hope we're saving the last best for last, but we'll see. Of course, um, um, Quantlin is also here. The term I like the term of the tireless runner, and uh, something that I I see myself also like tirelessly running around, trying to figure out things, trying to as a as a as a youth too, as a teenager or asking myself these these questions of about life what it's what is happening and throughout my lifeline has really been um the arts in in, in all its different forms i'm going to talk about uh the parts that are personally resonate with me and have helped me throughout life and also some of the stuff that haven't helped me and i'll look at that too and so yes the goal is here to to use the arts to understand things also to find meaning so even though i'm mentioning here stress and anxiety i think we can also add to it that quest for meaning for for me it's it's so important and and um, to give you here a brief overview, I think just a little bit about me to explain here my own uh, background here, and I hope that does work. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm actually, um, I was born in Iran, in, in Tehran, and um, this is, I've been told by Wikipedia, a picture here on a clear day. So there's a lot of pollution there. Usually it's not as clear, I, I would assume. Um, I don't remember much of it, but I was born there. Um, we, um, uh, when I was very young, so we're talking about six to eight months, um, we went to the United States, and that's where my dad studied at the University of Southern California for four years. And so English is my first language, technically. Uh, then we went back to Iran and um, the war had broken out. And so we had to, to leave the country. And so ended up as political asylums uh, in, uh, in Germany. And here you have a, a picture of this, this beautiful city, Nuremberg, um, which uh, I spent uh, about 13 years of my life there growing up. And it was challenging. I mean, especially Nuremberg was is a very um, traditional place, and so there was uh, open racism uh, going on as well. I was the only um, uh, foreigner in our school, how standard they call them in our, in our school. So I, I did experience uh, a lot of that firsthand growing up in in Germany. But I loved the language, I loved the culture, and that became my first language uh, at that point. And I did lose some of my English. Uh, then, um, after the reunion, actually things got worse in Germany, and so there was um, um, uh, uh, people who were who looked different, like myself, um, um, but who spoke German fluently but just looked different, would be would be attacked, and we had the uh, skinheads, the neo Nazis there, who would roam the streets and do do atrocious things to people, and so we just decided to um, to leave. And so I'm um, again here. This is me part two, a different part of my life where we moved to, to Canada and came to Vancouver. I, um, I studied. I started my studies in, at Kwantlen, Kwantlen College back then. And uh, again, as uh, as haven't introduced me, I, I, I got my degree at UBC. And then I looked for a challenge and I started to explore and decided to go to Mexico. Um, wanted to go for a year. I spent it five years there and um, explored and uh, met my wife, whose name is America in Mexico, who's Mexican, and then brought her, America, and my son, who was born there, to Canada. 
right? So I think uh, uh, this is yeah, a bit of an overview about my my life in in a, in a few minutes. I just want to share this too because that's that's how my educational journey, a post educational journey, started. I had just come from the gymnasium in Germany, and um, uh, a friend of mine said, "This is I look like Robert De Niro here." but uh, um, said um, enraging bull after the fight. So I don't know if that's a compliment. But what I find interesting is my student number is actually the same number as my employee number. So I like the, the whole cycle of life. Um, again, so this is here some random, uh, but I think somewhat relevant details. I do speak five languages, which gives me a different perspective of things. And I can shift my, my views depending on the languages that, uh, that I'm thinking in. Uh, I love reading, as, uh, as as you heard in my introduction. I uh, love watching movies, listening to music. Uh, I've been writing since grade two. That's when in grade one I started to learn German, which was a brand new language for me, and then st started attempting writing at uh, um, at the age of seven or eight. Um, have I have a philosophy and psychology blog, which I've been uh, keeping up for about uh, 15 years now. Which I very much enjoy. I've done also lots of book reviews there. I've had um, lots of very interesting comments as well. And more excitingly, actually, something that I very much enjoy, this is my passion, I've had a podcast since the pandemic and have some had, have some wonderful people, guests on my podcast. They're mostly interviews, and I've talked to various people from the mental health uh, profession, as well as others, as well as artists and so on. So it's a wonderful way to interact. And as I probably made clear so far, I cannot live without the arts and humanities, as I say here. So my thesis was actually based on the dangers of reading. So my master's thesis at UBC, um, I talked about two books that I compare, compared, uh, Madame Bovary by Flaubert, which was the main book, but then also Don Quixote, which is here, as you know, most likely, which is this um, this elderly gentleman who probably was a bit bored of life started reading this chivalrous uh, novels and decided like, hey, you know what? Uh, what? What the heck? I'll just become a knight myself. Uh, obviously not suited for it. And in a time period where knights did not exist anymore. So uh, but he imagines this this other life and he thinks he is this chivalrous knight fighting giants, but they're not really giants. And so he lives in his own world. Uh, it's it's funny and it's in a way, well, it's it's it helped him to 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 enjoy his life more. Uh, not so much for uh, Emma Bovary, and that's here the danger. She read all these um, romantic novels, perhaps not high literature. Uh, and um, she was uh, she had these ideas about romance that were just not did not become real in her her life when she got married to Charles Bovary, who who really uh, appreciated her and cared for her. She found marriage dull when she had a kid. She found motherhood dull. She's like looking for something else and something that did not exist. And in the end, um, a spoiler here, she she does commit suicide and she um, takes arsenic. And according to her books, she thought it would be, again, a romantic fading away. And it's it's agonizing death that she goes through at the very end. And so um, what I found interesting with these uh, two novels is that there's the interpretation of reading, but it can also be a misinterpretation simply due to the fact that language can be vague, experiences can be different, our, our, our own perspectives can be different, and we might misread, quote unquote, uh, the, the, the book itself or the ideas. And the book might or might not contain truth or reflect reality uh, accurately. And so we have to have some critical thinking as we are uh, reading these books, as we're consuming them. Uh, and it can happen when we try to do a full scale to to bring the novel to real life that we will have conflict and there are certain things that will be very hard to find, especially in matters of romance and love and marriage. We have the the the, the love in, in novels and in stories and uh, in, in theater and then our own experience of love. So the aim was here for me doing this was to show to better understand uh, um, reading and writing literature in the sense of appreciating, but also being being careful. 
And so I want to again go back. I grew up in Germany, so for me, um, Faust was uh, was an important piece of work. Uh, there you have Franz Schubert, whose uh, songs and uh, classical music just inspired me. I loved it. They were full of romance, and you have romantic music. And this is not Karl Marx. It's Johannes Brahms, who I very much uh, um, enjoyed. And um, what happened is, after consuming all of that, I became a sort of Emma Bovary as well. And for me, there was that, that, that friction here between romance and love as, as a teenager, which is kind of also um, idealistic in many ways and not reflected in reality in some ways. And so it's, in a way, it scarred me for life because these expectations like Emma Bovary that I had about romance did just not happen. And so in a way, I say that scarred me for life, but it also saved me because I appreciated things on a much, much deeper level. Uh, any kind of relationship, friendship, any emotions, any connections, again, with literature, with movies and so on. And I think because of that. So apathy was not something that uh, interested me or that got hold of me back then. I think thanks to to these 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 notions, these uh, these works that I consumed at a, at a, at a young age. A mantra, uh, Sting, has uh, the song Englishman in New York. I can relate to that because, again, I don't have a home. I don't have a route. And so uh, I feel that I'm always on, on, on the run and moving like a nomadic lifestyle. And so, but that really inspired me. Be yourself, no matter what they say. Now, uh, we want to be careful, of, of course, being with yourself. But in many ways, that was the quest of finding myself and not being afraid what others want me to be or how they want me to be and so on. And I think that uh, that line has been very inspiring. Uh, another one, and again, talking about uh, music here, yeah, alternative rock now, I moved from classical music to alternative rock, is just by um, Radiohead. And there's this line that really like got me. And if you've seen the video, it's it's quite amazing but that we do things to ourselves. In many ways, I ask myself, like, what are some things that I've done to myself? And really taking ownership, being accountable for things, the way uh, th things make me feel, like looking deep inside, going within, and trying to figure out why is this happening? Why am I reacting a certain way? Why am I feeling a certain way? And uh, in many ways, we realize there's a part that we play as well and to recognize that and to try to 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 rectify that and deal with it, which is often very difficult. But what can help us throughout is uh, opera and poetry. What they do is they they not only clarify our feelings, but they add depth to it that magnify it. So uh, you love someone and you say, I love you. Well, that's great. But if you could say it poetically, if you could make a song if you could uh, write an opera for them. Well, that is so much more. So I think really getting deep with our feelings and really connecting with that, that's what poetry and opera does. And you can connect uh, with it in a, in a very, very intimate way. And just the overall benefits of the arts, it's really a matter of perspective because we are, and we've always been, that's not something new, but we have a type of tunnel vision. And the thing is, we only see the world through our own eyes. I only know my own thoughts. I only know my own family. And then when you walk out and you see, okay, there are families that are slightly different, there's families that are the same. But with literature and with the arts and with music and with movies, we can widen our angles. And so, especially with books, we get a different perspective. We actually enter the mind of another person. We enter the mind of another gender. We enter the mind of another culture when we have these uh, different characters. And what that does is, if we're open to it, it gives us a whole different perspective of things. And we see things in a very different way that we wouldn't have done if we hadn't read those or if we hadn't consumed those works of art. And so, and we want to also be careful of not adding to the echo chambers of, of, of reading the same kinds of books, right? So if, if you're interested in Marx and just reading Marx's books, then you kind of kind of get trapped in it because you're not widening your angles. You're actually uh, 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 limiting your perspectives. 
But in terms of literature is also when you see these characters, they feel real and you identify with them and we have empathy for them. Somebody like Emma Bovary, somebody like Don Quixote, who is by all accounts, he seems ridiculous. We laugh at him, but we, we kind of sympathize with him. And uh, I think that's that's really important. And we don't usually, again, have access to that in our ordinary uh, daily lives. I want to give a specific example of Mozart's magic flute, uh, which is considered one of his lesser works. And I disagree because of all the symbolism that's included there. His flute is magical and that we can see that that's music, right? That's music. He expresses his own being uh, through this flute, which is magical, uh, of course, and which um, uh, makes uh, affects all the people around him too, that uh, the people that are surrounding him. And so what it does is it helps him become more of an individual. And so we have here the individuation where you become more yourself and how you are moving away from others in a certain way. Of course, nothing too extreme. And I'll talk about extremes a bit later, but you wanna make sure that you don't just fall into conformity because the conformity is the opposite of being an individual. So here you're defining yourself. You're going a certain path that is really your own path. And if we look at our hero, Tamino though, um, he's a bit of a reluctant hero. Uh, his, his entry is, he faints. Yeah, he sees a monster and he sees this, this creature and faints. And um, that's not our regular understanding of a hero, but that's very human. And I, I really like that. It's uh, a person who's flawed, a person who is scared. And of course, uh, he immediately falls in love with an image of Tamina, something that my youth self would say, oh, of course, I see a beautiful image, of course, immediately fall in love with, uh, with her without even knowing her, knowing anything about her, just that, that picture. Um, and then he is led to believe to rescue her from the evil Sarastro. If you know the magic flute, is actually Sarastro is not evil. Um, and uh, he's urged on by Pamina's mother, the queen of the night, who's actually evil. So uh, that play with it too, usually soprano tends to represent the good. Uh, you have the uh, the lower, the baritone usually is evil. And uh, Mozart plays with that in many, in many ways. And it's quite fascinating. So there's this power that exists in music itself that can help us, that can heal us in many ways. And that can also empower us and I think that is very important to have that, to find your own voice. And I'm going to talk about this a bit later too. And he has even a sidekick. Yeah, he has Papageno who has bells. And when he plays these bells, these, these evil people become stunned and they can't move because they're mesmerized by this, this beauty. And I love that too, because we want to, we don't want to dehumanize people. We want to look at what is it? There's something they would probably respond to. What better way than music? Now, um, there's also a manifestation of hope and optimism in a, in a world that's more uh, cynical. I think I, I, like, I like that. They both get the girl uh, or the girls here. And you have Tamino with Pamina, with similar names. And then Papageno finds his soulmate, uh, Papagena. Uh, Tamino becomes a, a sort of hero where he has to face these challenges and he overcomes them like the knight. And uh, um, Papageno is not a hero <laughs> by no accounts, but he does find his is love to, and he's fine with that, right? So not everyone needs to be a hero, like uh, Tamino in this case, and he's he's happy with his loved one, and then they get married and they start arguing about how many kids to have, but that's a different story. Now, the bottom line is Amadeus rocks, and so I found it very interesting to watch the movie Amadeus, made in 1980 by Milos Forman, because it's not factual, but who cares? In this case, it gives us the spirit of the the person, how we imagine him. And I think he was probably like that. Uh, a very playful person, probably often disrespectful of authority. And I see him there. So um, recently I heard uh, some of his music at a tampon commercial and I did not like that at all, but he would. He would have enjoyed it. It's like, yeah, perfect. That's exactly what my music is for. And I, I think that uh, that attitude was shown that he was a bit of a rock star, and he was. And so um, Falco, the Austrian rapper around 85, was so inspired by this movie, and I think actually, yeah, the movie 84, and he 
made a song, which is now known as Rock Me Amadeus, and turned him into a rock star. And people became more interested in the music of, uh, of Mozart. And I think that's only a good thing. Now, I want to move to uh, deeper literature here. Now, moving from music to literature. And I think one of the best novels ever written, in my view, is Ulysses. Uh, by James Joyce. It's hard to read. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge. Well, it's a, it's, it's a big challenge. But we enter the mind of the Blooms, Leopold and Molly Bloom, and Stephen Dedos. And what is fascinating is it takes place within 24 hours in a day in a specific place, Dublin. Uh, and we really enter the minds. I mean, we're there with them. We walk with them. We go to places with them. There's the, the stream of consciousness that shows us their train of thought and they're thinking one thing, they see something, they get reminded of something else the way we think as well and we go through our days. So it's fascinating to see that. And then, of course, it ends with, with Molly's monologue that was uh, for many too much to handle at the time, but it is without punctuation. We get the full access to the thought. And what is also amazing here is a day in a place an ordinary day, nothing really happens, but there is this mythical dimension behind it. There's this connection to Ulysses and this 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 mythical world that exists in the mundane, and you have the combination of both, which is again a very very fascinating. Uh, the cinematic equivalent of that would be a film that I've watched many many times, which is uh, translates Wings of Desire. I like the German title better because Himmel über Berlin is both. It could be paradise as well as the sky. That's the same word. And so we have here an angel, uh, two angels actually, and uh, Demiel, he is uh, with his friend Cassiel. They watch people and they can't influence their actions because of free will. But there's two. these are two angels that just listen to the thoughts. And most of them uh, they, uh, they're, they're sad people. Most of them you have here a picture as a person about to commit suicide and uh, then the angel can't stop him and he's, he's just devastated. And it's like, and you see the whole world here through their eyes, which is black and white, until Damiel and here he falls in love with a trapeze artist of all people and he decides to become human. And so it's a big step because he will become mortal but it's fascinating how the film then shifts and suddenly we have color. He becomes human. He's getting coffee and he's like rubbing his hands and it's like, is it, is this the cold? Wow, is it colder than usual? He's asking the, the coffee vendor and he's drinking coffee and wow, this is amazing, right? And so the sensual parts of life that come, um, that is shown to us and so once I, I see this, every time I see this movie, I appreciate everything a bit more. It's like, yes, it's flawed. Yes, there are many things that uh, we can't control, but it's also very beautiful. And and Damiel does this for love. Again, my, my youthful self says, wonderful. Right? And so he gives up being an angel to become uh, a, a human. Now, I want to talk about a genre, which, uh, uh, again, people have probably very strong opinions about. When we think of you know, Westerns, it's usually like also we think of conservative views of cowboys riding in the sunset. Most people are not interested in it. Uh, and we think of these guys, perhaps for me, uh, um, uh, Lucky Luke was uh, a comic I really enjoyed as uh, in Germany, for sure. And uh, well, you have the cowboy president. But um, if we think about the Western landscape, I find that quite fascinating because there's this, this desolate landscape, these... Um, it's rough terrain, trying to survive again for anyone who who lived in the time. But when we get to later westerns, it's not here just represented as as good and evil, or or again uh, as seeing uh, uh, Indians as evil and the cowboys as good. We have here a different perspective of it when we get the outlaw hero. And so Billy the Kid, uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid is is a film I I, I quite find fascinating because you have Billy the Kid who is breaking the law and is being chased by his friend who joins the law and used to be a criminal himself, uh, Pat Garrett. And it's based on, on true events, um, of course, embellished in many ways. But um, I find that interesting because the law is not as clean here 
Uh, he has his own past and he's probably doing it for money. And Billy the Kid is um, somebody that I enjoy watching and I side with him, I sympathize with him, but he's also not a good person. He shoots people in the back, which is uh, not a hero by, by any sense. So, uh, and it's, I think that is a closer representation of what happens in the world again. It's not clear cut, good versus evil and so on. And so we see that sense for justice, the chivalrous, the knight, the Don Quixote, and this quest for justice that we have, romance, these romantic ideals. Again, we do want to be inspired by it, but we have to also, again, always be careful as we're taking it in. A modern version of it is a dark knight, right? And he's called dark for a reason, because then he engages in things that where the ends don't justify the means in some ways, and we have to be careful with that. But here, the good fighting against evil represented by by the Joker. But again, that idea of a knight continues, that a myth or legend continues to, to, our, uh, to our days. And we see it in cinema too, now with the anti-hero who uh, decide to uh, take up, take justice into their own hands. Uh, we can see them as heroes, but they are not. But we can, we understand, and there's the empathy again. We understand how Travis Mickle would be in that position, but hopefully again, and that's the danger of it, we don't want to reenact those scenes. And so I think that's important to have that, the distance as we're watching and not getting trapped in, in some of those ideas, as well as Dirty Harry, who uh, goes against corruption. And he says, I will take the law into my own hands because the police, the authorities are corrupt. And so they are heroes, but they're also anti-heroes because there's a dark side to them as well. Now, during, uh, during the times, we often films show certain fears that we all have. And by doing it, it's kind of connecting us. We can connect with that fear because we understand it when we had the, the period of the cold and nuclear threat of a war, like nuclear wars, a communist threat, uh, which is here an invasion of the body snatchers. There could be a communist living next to you. There might be, uh, they, they lose their brain. They are not able to function and think. So we have the zombie movies that, that uh, were, were fashionable then. And it's that constant paranoia of maybe somebody is trying to get me. And in a way we go through it and we have it in today's world as well, where we have a paranoia in a way as well of representing uh, the white male patriarchy as something, something evil, purely evil. And which I find a bit troubling, especially in movies like Get Out, where um, all the white characters, including his girlfriend, is is evil, right? and and he's the only good one. What I find also troubling is a film like Birds of Prey, where you have they beat the men. You have five women who beat men, and it's played for comic effect, kill them in some cases. And I'm wondering, well, what if we switch it around? I always ask that. What if we switch around the roles, and we don't have we have the white person in a world of uh, all of them African Americans, and we have that film. Or we change the five women into five guys who start doing the same to women. And we realize there's, there's something off there, and we have to be very careful. As entertainment, it might be fun, but we have to be careful that it doesn't go beyond that and influencing us, especially unconsciously. And uh, when I was talking in my classes often, before in the past, I would talk about uh, what people talk about conversion therapy, which is, again, for, for people who are gay to be forced uh, or bisexual to be forced to um, to change their ways. And I said, well, think about the other way around, right? So if, if everyone is uh, gay around you and you're the one who is being forced to change, and then, then people realize that the, we're not accepting people as who they are, and that is a very dangerous thing, and we have to be aware of that throughout, of others being the way they are and not representing things in a very uh, simplified fashion of, again, good versus evil. It's kind of a mix of it. And to extend that, the idea of eat the rich, right? So the war on wealth and privilege. And so, um, which is, again, in many ways also troubling when we see that in movies like The Menu or even Glass Onion, where, um, yeah, so the evil are always rich. And uh, they are, there are evil things happening, of course. Right, but we have to. We should not dehumanize them, and I think that is something that is occurring. And we have to be very careful. At these are are human beings, flawed ones, 
some of them not very good, of course, but uh, we have to keep that in mind too. And we see that often now represented and I think something to keep in mind uh, of, of not seeing everyone the same way in a, in a negative light and to be aware of that. Now, what we should avoid, and that's here my recommendation, any kind of extreme or radical shifts or swings where we take too much one side, and that's our tunnel vision. And we have to be careful because uh, it's not as clear cut, as simple as that. And what happens often, and I just do understand, is based on fear, we try to have shortcuts, we jump to conclusions. We see something and immediately it's that, right? And we have to be careful and take pause there be be kind of curious about our response to to that situation and and think about it instead of quickly jumping to one conclusion saying well this must be because of that also consider other alternatives or possible explanations for it and uh, i think to broaden our horizon everyone each of us in our own ways and to avoid demonizing others right and again dehumanizing them i mean there's no better example than john Milton's the devil who is evil, but he used to be an angel, right? He's a fallen angel. So if if the ultimate evil here has a side of goodness in them, uh, a, a spark in it at least, then we should acknowledge that and be aware of that too. And that's something that uh, we can't just full scale be on one side or the other or have extreme views in my view. And doing justice to these terms. We have liberté, égalité, fraternité here uh, for the French Revolution, which are commendable things. But what did happen after? Uh, so in, in, in that time period, uh, uh, a lot of the inability on, were, uh, they, uh, their heads were chopped off, right? They had the guillotine. And is that violence really justified? I understand the anger. But what came after? They lost, so they didn't have a, a king anymore, but they got an emperor, which is, in my view, a bit worse. They took it a step further with Napoleon. And I want to specifically mention a case that Napoleon was responsible for, and that also happened during the French Revolution, or before it as well. Um, you probably have not heard of Joseph Bologne, who's, uh, uh, who's a French composer. A very good one. I've heard some of his music. I never had access to his music before. And uh, thanks to, yes, this is a case of racism. This is a, a case of um, not allowing him to do his work of, in his time and, of course, after too. And what I find troubling is uh, somebody like Napoleon, he reinstated slavery when he was in power. What happened to the spirit of revolution, of freedom, of equality? And equality, I mean, equality includes everyone, not just the people we prefer, but everyone. And I think the other thing also with this, um, with his uh, music, is well, as, as a person, though, now he's not just a composer, he was also a great fencer. He was uh, very talented. He fought on the side of the revolutionaries. And he fought for justice, for equality, and then he gets arrested and he faces the guillotine himself. The reason for it is because his dad was white nobility. And you you just can't believe how could he be in jail. And he was, thank God, he was pardoned just in time. But just the idea of having him sit in that jail, somebody who fought for the cause ends up being uh, a prisoner and almost uh, sentenced to death. So that again makes us pause of something is is not right there and we have to be very careful with, with some of these uh, ideas and trends that we have. So uh, thinking critically, feeling empathy at all times. This is very important that we need to uh, augment, in our, augment in our lives. Um, we have this unconscious fears and they're justified. That's perfectly fine, we all do. And so, a way of releasing it is again the arts, because it can these negative feelings that we need to process: anger, hatred, frustration, and many, many more. We need to go through them, and yes, the arts can help that. So if if you're watching and eat, eat uh, the rich movie and it makes you feel okay, a bit relieved, then that's good, right? Uh, to relieve the tension that we have, temporary relief here, um, which is why also many people love horror films 
but because you're facing the danger of death, but and that's symbolically, but you're safe in your home. And so you go through those emotions and you do feel them, of course. You identify with the characters if it's well done. And in a way, it gives us an access to this unconscious fear of death that we all carry around all the time. So it needs an outlet. And I think arts can really help us to go through those emotions that we usually in daily life do not uh, do not look at, do not acknowledge. And finally, uh, there's also like feelings of sexuality and aggression that is shown and presented in there. Somebody like Quentin Tarantino makes uh, makes great movies. They're very violent, but I think it helped him to not act them out in many ways. So by representing, that's catharsis again. He presents his ideas in art and literature and so on. It's fine. In real life, it is not. Right? So I have to, again, know that distinction between the arts, what is allowed there, and reality. And now, a film that I don't like, but many people do, is, is, is Fight Club. And um, if you have this anger and you will like, listen to rock music when you're angry, or heavy metal, actually, further, and uh, watching this film, then that's good, right? Because you are dealing with your feelings of frustration and anger. Uh, of course, the idea is, again, not to go out and start a fight. Right? So that's that's not the aim here. Um, but what I personally found fascinating was the movie A Monster Calls about grief, about this this uh, adolescent who loses his mother and how she tries to deal with that, presented in a, in a very visceral form with this monster and his imagination. And I think that is very that's something we don't talk about enough in, in, in our daily lives for good reason. I do understand it. But it's also to be able to express that somehow. And I think that's when the arts come uh, come into play, and they're very, very important. Just to remind you again of the dangers of reading, though, by taking it too far. Again, I have another example. Uh, Timothy Treadwell, uh, he's represented in the documentary Grizzly Man. Um, he had this very romantic notions of bears, uh, going back to his uh, childhood, having a teddy bear, and he ended up living with them. And it went OK for a number of years. But he did, he did die, right, unfortunately, uh, sadly, and he was attacked by one of the bears. And so, and here you have him read a book about bears, and you have the actual bear behind him. So he has some amazing footage uh, in that, uh, from that time period, but sadly, we, we, we lost him. And then we have a very different one, but also real life example, Sean Penn's Into the Wilds film on Alexander Supertram, which is his, uh, not his real name, Christopher McCandles, who read all these beautiful works by Emerson and Thoreau. And he's like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm sick and tired of civilization. I'm just going to go and move into the wild and live there. And um, it does not end well for him either. And he ends up being poisoned by some of the, the, the food he eats. So um, although the desire, I do understand, we do again have to be careful in real life of not taking it uh, too far or be reckless about it, which I think in both cases, uh, and these are uh, sadly uh, chose that reckless path in, in terms of uh, um, trying to bring it into reality in a way that was not uh, not beneficial. But Focus here is also the good feelings, of course, everything in balance, and um, it creates a shared culture. I love the, the 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 film day, the National Film Day, which were short films again representing uh, uh, Canada and Canadian culture. And what I found a very interesting, different perspectives that we got through these short films, uh, and of course. Uh, um, uh, watching films with my son here, uh, it creates experiences and fond memories. And and uh, he's uh, he will probably talk to me about seeing movies like Avatar on the screen together and uh, and so on. So I think that creates also bonding in many ways, apart from the other psychological benefits that we have. I want to briefly end also on creating art. Uh, now I think everyone of us should try whatever is resonates with us, the creative drive or the force in terms of also performing arts. I was in in uh, theater when I was much younger as a youth. I loved that experience. I did improv a bit later as an undergrad. Very much love that experience too, which I think teaching is basically improv, uh, except more academically oriented. And I think we need that. And um, it can heal us in many ways. Uh, the example of, again, the story of grief, 
and you find solace, you find comfort. Uh, of course, we want real people too. We don't want to just uh, escape in the arts, but it, it adds, it helps. And anything really uh, that can help us to go through these phases is important. And I think when we create our own piece of work, so much more so, and, um, and again, in whatever way or shape or form that we have, and it also helps us to find our own unique voice. And that is important because what do we like about the arts? We like the uniqueness. Somebody like Bob Dylan is, doesn't have a great voice, but he's amazing because he is expressing unique characteristics. There's nobody like him and never will be anybody like him as well. And I think that's part of us to really find, tap into that, not be like everyone else, but to stand out. And that's why we like somebody like Mozart. That's why we like somebody like, again, Bob Dylan or any other filmmaker. They have their own trademarks and they explore it. And we like all the works they create because of that. That's a common thread. And um, just here also, again, in terms of uh, uh, politically here, dictatorships and any totalitarian regime does not like individuality. Uh, this is an amazing film based on a true story on Franz uh, Jägerstetter, uh, who was a farmer a person who had no real influence on the Nazis, but he, in his small town, he refused to do the Hitler salute. Now, that was scary for many because the uh, majority said, well, what do you mean you don't do the Hitler salute? His community was putting pressure on him. Soldiers came and they arrested him. They took him to prison. They tortured him and he still wouldn't do it. And in the end, sadly, he dies. But it's that act of resistance that he has of, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do something. I, want, I don't want to be forced, even though everyone else is doing it. I'm going to stand out. Now, it could be taken too far. I think I would not do that. And he, he, he risked his life. But we do have real life examples of that in terms of also Navalny, who stood up and said, I'm just going to face this situation. And that is very heroic, perhaps too much so, I don't know. I can't judge that. But I think uh, this shows us that individuality is often feared uh, by regimes that want you to think alike, that want you to, to be alike, to do the same things. And so that leads me towards thinking outside of the box, something that uh, I always try to do and uh, I think is important because that, again, is our difference. We bring a unique perspective to the wor world. Why not explore that and express it? But it is so, so hard to do often. And even in today's time, it's very hard to do. And you often get punished for it, for expressing views that don't align with what others would like to see or hear. But we have to be careful with that. And um, questioning everything. Yes, should we? Why? And why not? And so it builds this, this thing, but being open to things, being open to different views. And... Um, we do get triggered by certain things, but also taking a step back and being curious about it. I'm curious about your point of view. I don't agree with it, but I want to know more about it. This is what my podcast is about. And I'm going to talk to uh, Conrad Black tomorrow, which is quite fascinating because, again, very different person. But I'm curious about what do they bring to the world? What is their view? And just to listen doesn't mean that you agree with them. And the other thing is not throwing out the uh, baby with the bathwater, which I found out was a German expression. And I think, again, that's one we have to be very cautious to. And um, uh, your words of wisdom by Epictetus, that's not me, but as any person capable of angering you becomes your master. And we have to be careful with that because he can anger you only when you permit yourself to be disturbed by him. And that gets, takes me back to um, uh, the just uh, lyrics, yeah, that we do it to ourselves. But once we, we control that, we are not triggered anymore. And yesterday I was at a UBC talk where we had a person who was an anti-vaxxer, uh, somebody who would boil my blood during the pandemic. I would get very angry. But my response was actually, I was okay with it. I don't agree with him in any ways. Of course not. But why not have him ask his question? But there was this hostility around him. And I think... Uh, we have to be, again, opening up a bit of just listening, of being curious about why do people think that way and uh, uh, finding here also the reasons why why people do evil things as well, of trying to look behind it.
And so I was quite fascinated. This is another person I'll have on the podcast soon uh, uh, about the Deerfield Massacre, which I'd never heard about. And here we have a small town that got surprise attacked by by French and uh, natives from uh, from who went from Canada, was known as Canada now. And um, and he, he talks about this history is not just the story of what happened, but also how the story of what happened is told. And even today, how are we telling the stories and why are we telling it a certain way? And so there's this like very moving part. Well, there's this massacre. We have these um, these natives uh, along the, the with the French. Um, they ended up um, killing a lot of the uh, the residents, including the kids of of a couple uh, of a couple of kids of this reverend uh, in front of him, their infants, and uh, and it's horrible. And some of them were taken; they were all taken uh, captive. But then some of the kids ended up growing in those uh, living in those native communities lost touch with their language, like the daughter of Reverend John Williams, and married in that tradition. And then later on, they came back to Deerfield. So we have that mix, that that uh, that opening up to other perspectives as well. And suddenly they come back and there's this, this, this moment of seeing uh, the madness that was of the moment and going past that, going beyond that, and finding here uh, a way of of dealing with uh, the, these traumatic things that happen, and um, and 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 in a way also uh, processing it. So uh, that was a different perspective that I hadn't considered, but I'm always open uh, to that. And arts and humanities can bring us uh, closer to life's truths. I think uh, I hope that was established here. I want you to be not disgruntled, but gruntled. Uh, this is my way, again, thinking outside of the box. It does exist. If you can be disgruntled, then why not be gruntled? Which I think is, is please, satisfied, contented, uh, contented, and also inspired. I think inspiration is so important for us. Creativity comes from inspiration. And uh, I want to also mention lyrics from La La Land. Uh, a bit of madness is key, and uh, I want to... And say uh, give a shout out to 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 all the mental health professionals who are here uh, and and many of uh, of my friends and colleagues too. Uh, here's to the fools who dream, crazy as they may seem. Bring on the painters, the poets, and plays to give us new colors to see. Who knows where it would lead us again if we're open, if we're willing, as well as how are we going to use it? Are we going to use it for enhancing our lives? Or are we trying to escape or creating here our own echo chamber or a tunnel vision uh, or trying to transport it without thinking into the reality? Well, that's the question. And my question for you, too, here as, as uh, at the end of my talk is, how are you going to resonate now with arts? How are you going to engage with it to improve your life, to enhance your life? And um, what are some things that could come to mind to you? Personally, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank this committee, the Arts Research Committee, for giving me the opportunity to speak here as a part of the speaker series. So Arts Research Scholarship and Creativity. Again, creativity is not just a buzzword for me. It's, it's everyday life, and I think it, it should be, and I hope others are inspired to do so too. And just wanted to let you know, again, so I mentioned my blog, which is The Rash's World, and uh, again, my podcast, which is here an offshoot of that. And you will see um, various people speaking uh, on it. And I invite you to, to visit me there. And uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions or comments, I'm going to stop sharing so I can actually see you all. Thank you so much, Arash. Such, such a wonderful, wide ranging, and thought provoking presentation. So let's try straight up for questions in about 10 minutes. All right, yeah, Carla, please, yeah. Um, sorry, you're muted. Sorry, Carla, you're, you're muted, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Your presentation is so rich, and it's interesting how you delve into the psyche so much when we're looking at stress reduction mm -hmm. and anxiety reduction. And what would you say in today's world where there's so much stress around politics, and then we have the ego anxiety and I don't want to get into too many things all at once. But what would you say for people who are feeling really stressed and anxious 
Um, aside from delving into the arts, what are some daily practices you think people might engage in so that as this year with all of its turmoil, you know, continues to churn, what they might do to feel more empowered and less anxious? Wonderful question. Thank you so much, Carla. And so uh, I think we also have to think uh, of there are parts ourselves who feel, feel a certain way. And I've, I've had uh, um, congressmen, uh, Republicans and Democrats on my podcast. And so the, the, the parts of it might be different and we might disagree with certain parts, but there are many things we have in common. And so when we focus too much on the parts, we lose track of that. And I think, yes, there are differences, but well, what do we have in common? And uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Carla, I, I, I love your book, if, if, if Imperfect Love, where we see love not as something that's striving for perfection, but with all its flaws. And then if we don't, if we see our loved one, not as this perfect image we'd like them to be, but as the way they are with all their quirks, with all their flaws and so on, it makes them human. And I think perfection is what people are striving for nowadays. It's like it has to be completely perfect or you have to have the perfect views that we think. I think that's an issue there. We, we lose track of their individuality as well as the different parts of them. And some of them we like, some of them we don't like, and that's perfectly fine. If it causes distress, you can talk about it, but try not to be curious about it. Why do you, do you feel that way yourself? And why does the other believe that? And, and if it doesn't work out, then find other things you have in common, I think. I love that. And I just want to say that what I was picking up in so much of what you were talking about with the arts was using that tension of the opposites whether it was a book you were discussing or a movie, that it's really about being able to sit with and play with that tension of the opposites, which I think is one of the reasons there's so much political turmoil. But anyway, thank you for your Thanks sage so advice on that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I'm gonna pop in, I have another one. On okay. individuation, I didn't want to bypass that that one because it was so such a rich opportunity to look at. We often mistake, at least in the US, which is where I'm based, we often mistake individuation for a midlife crisis. And that lack of understanding contributes to fosters. I've seen so much stress and anxiety rather than seeing individuation as possibly a lifelong process um, and that it can occur at any age. But I'm wondering your thoughts on that. I, I, I when I take a walk, there's this this garbage bin. I don't know why it's on a garbage bin, but there's this uh, writing on it. It's graffiti. Don't let a, a go a good crisis go to waste. And I just love that. And I think crisis is here opportunity as well. And it's a decision because when you had a critical point in a disease, it could get worse or it could get better. And I think that's what crisis is. So what path are you going to take? And I'd say take the better path. And uh, definitely, it's a great opportunity as someone who is going through a midlife crisis myself. Um, sorry, any uh, questions? Are there any questions in the chat, perhaps, comment? I don't see them now. Uh, lots of positive comments about the presentation. Okay. I, I, I have a question. Um, sure. I, I'm curious, as someone who will have engaged with many works of literature in different languages, as a psychologist, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very interested in the linguistic relati relativity hypothesis, yeah, which yeah. Um, is the idea, of course, that you know, the, the language that you're engaging in can affect how you think and see the world. Yes. I wonder if you have, any, sure. do you have any brief personal examples of that, where you've engaged in the same work, but in different languages and taken different things from it because of that? I've given a talk on that actually, so yeah, yeah. so yeah. if uh, maybe for next year's art speakers, you're allowed to do that. But absolutely, and it's amazing because there's certain words that don't exist. So we we use words like in German Schadenfreude. Uh, so, sometimes we also like misrepresent it or don't fully understand it because it's taken out of the context of a culture and a language. So we got to be careful with that too. But that's it. We don't have a word for it. Why do the Germans have a word for it? Well, that's another question, right? But uh, I, I think that's that's really important. And when I do that, I, my perspective does change. And I think that gives me a certain flexibility as well, uh, added to my upbringing where I've experienced a bit of everything. So, uh, and it's it's not to brag. It's just, just my life has been like that. And I've added to it myself. And it's a personal choice as well. But I think that's important. Yes, absolutely. 
have a follow up comment if there are no other questions for now. Uh, Carla, is that a legacy hand or do you have another question? <laughs> oh. I, I have a follow up thought in that there's an interesting book called The Better Angels of Our Nature by Stephen Pinker, and he talks about um, how, how societies, in his view, have become less aggressive and violent over time. And one of the key trends he talks about, and that is the idea of increased cosmopolitanism. It's the idea that it blends together various things, including mass literacy. And he thinks that the mass literacy was a, was a way of people engaging in literature. And literature became a way of fostering empathy because you could really enter someone's inner world. Yes, yes. And then also another part of that, um, that trend um, was also to do with mobility, the ability of people to travel more widely than they have. And it seems like your, your, your experiences in life are a living embodiment yes. of that. Do you have any perspectives on how um, traveling widely versus engaging deeply in the arts um, can give different sorts of insights? Because I can see how they would bring a lot of the same types of insights, but um, any any differences you've noticed between traveling widely and, and engaging deeply in the arts? Great question. I just like what you talk about reminded me of Factfulness, the book about how all these ideas we have and we have to have we tend to have a negative view of things. And you talk about literacy that's improved, even poverty has improved. But when we focus too much on a very narrow part, we it, it influences our way of feeling, our way of responding to things. And uh, I mean, climate climate change is real and we see that at any moment in our lives. So that is something that we have to, have to, to of course, take very seriously. But that there is all these improvements that we don't don't see. And I think that's, again, the perspective. And to go to your question again, yes, traveling really opened up my, my eyes. And I remember uh, also there was a, a group of homeless uh, people in, in Canada that were sent to uh, places in, in, in Latin America, I think maybe Brazil, who uh, interacted in a soccer tournament with the, the homeless in those areas. Uh, areas. And uh, our our, our homeless were like, oh my God, you guys are really poor. They gave them shoes, they gave them things. So it's 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 really that perspective of poverty too for myself, seeing the poor in 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 Mexico, for instance, in certain areas, was 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 devastating. And yes, it's bad enough here, but then you see uh, uh, children with uh, uh, out in the streets, and so it is broad in your experience, and also like uh, uh, appreciating especially also what we have so much more and a different perspective as well and understanding why people choose to to go to other countries to escape the horrors that they have and uh, yes we can travel that is a great thing that we should take advantage of because it's become uh, much easier to to move about uh, and we have uh, in terms of economically for us again for those who have the opportunity and uh, I think that's hugely important because you're really opening up not just reading about it but actually experiencing the culture in flesh in, in uh, at hand and that is very important yes absolutely. Thank you. Any final questions? We're, we're pretty much up against time, but if anyone's got a final question, I'd love to hear one more question. Donald has a question. Yeah. yeah, what's your question, Don? I don't think we can hear you, Donald. Is your mic on? I, I think um, that Donald left a message in the chat. I don't know if that's related okay. to the question. Um, said that it's fascinating how the arts are both a part of culture and a critique of it at the same time. Yes, Thoughts? yes, I love that. That's a great comment, absolutely. And that's necessary. And that's, again, why certain governments do not like the arts and they burn books, they, and the example of the Nazis again, or or banned books. So I think that is very dangerous, right? And I think we have to, like, give people access to it, but give them the dose of critical thinking. It's like, yeah, you can read this, but don't believe everything you read, right? It should come with a, a disclaimer, a word of caution there. But absolutely, yeah, yeah, hugely important. And those are the best writers too, because in their time they're frowned upon and they're jailed, and then they come up as as, as true heroes, and we appreciate their works for that. Somebody like James Joyce was, uh, in his time uh, again, was was a bit challenged for many people. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you for attending, and uh, yes, all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Arash. That was Thank, you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Carl Hammond. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, Take everyone. Care.